And we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming to this webinar. This is, uh, my name is Stace Maples. I'm the geospatial manager here at the Stanford Geospatial Center. I'm here, uh, I'm actually in the office today. Um, I have to come in once a week uh, to help page books from this library and send them over to Green for pickup. And so this is when I like to do my teaching because my kids aren't screaming. I've got great internet access and uh, I have a, a nice mathy background. Um, so today what we're gonna do is I'm gonna walk through a, uh, a tutorial, a workshop that I've put into a story map, which is actually an application from ArcGIS Online. Um, we won't do story maps today, but you can take everything that we do in the workshop today and put it into a story map very easily. Um, today's workshop is in a story map, and um, hopefully you are still seeing, uh, can I get a thumbs up if you're still seeing my, uh, my browser here, my Stanford Geospatial Center browser? All right, good. Um, it doesn't have the little green boundary around it anymore, and I'm not sure why, but um, all right, so this is where we're going to start from, and I'll just go ahead and put uh, this URL into the chat, uh, because this will be where you will access the tutorial uh, as well. Um, this is our public facing ArcGIS organizational page for Stanford. And uh, this is the first page you'll land on even if you're not logged in. And in fact, I should probably log, sign out unless, oh, let's see. Oh, you know what? This is a better idea. Why don't I do this? I'm going to close these and now I'm in a private window. That's much better. All right. And we'll just go back to where we were beginning. All right, back to the Stanford landing page. I'm not signed in here because I want to show you the entire workflow. The sign in can be a little weird if you haven't done it before, but once you, you know which button to push and what to put where, um, it's pretty straightforward. Here on the public facing landing page, you'll find our public um, uh, materials. These are most of these are story maps. Um, we've got a story map for a workshop that I do on a regular basis called Google Earth Engine. We've got a getting started. This is a great story map source for how to find data, software, where to get downloads, how to license software here at Stanford and so on. And then here, ArcGIS Online 101, that's the workshop that we're actually going to do today. So um, if you would go ahead and click on that and you can have that open here uh, in your browser window as we're walking through. So I'm still not logged in and we'll do that in just a moment. Um, but here on ArcGIS Online 101, um, we're gonna start uh, by downloading the, uh, the data that we'll use for this particular workshop. And you're welcome to just sit back and watch what I do and then go back to this material because it's gonna stay online uh, and walk through it yourself if you want later on. Um, but here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get ready by just downloading this zip file of uh, of data, and this is coming from GitHub. I keep it on GitHub so it's easy to maintain. And I'm just gonna make a new folder uh, called AGO 101, and I'll create that in my downloads folder and, and save that right there. And that should be pretty quick. It's, uh, it's a fairly small amount of data. And so I'll show that in my finder and go ahead and See if I just double click on that in my Mac, then it will unzip that to a folder. In Windows, you'll right click and I think it's unzip or um, uh, it should be unzip. Um, now, if I browse in here, what I want to show you is that we've just got we've got some data. Some of this stuff is from the the GitHub page, but if you look in here, there's a data folder. And in this data folder, we've got a couple of things. We've got this study area shape file and I'm going to change the view here because it's a little easier to talk about shape files in this in this view. So we've got a couple of things here. First of all, we've got a shape file and the first thing I want to explain about shape files is that that's a terrible name for this particular data format. A shape file is not a file, it's a big collection of files. And it can be a, a varying number of files depending on what kind of data is in that particular shape file. Here you see we've got a study area shape file. And, and so all of the component files in this shape file are called study area dot and then the extension of the file that makes up the whole shape file. And a couple of them, I mean, you actually do have a dot SHP, a shape file um, uh, file format here. This holds the geometry. And then up here, you've got this DBF. That's a uh, DBase uh, 
file format. Um, and this is a table uh, that holds all the attribute data. The PRJ file holds the spatial reference information and that, that makes it possible for a GIS software to take that geometry that's in the shape fo uh, file format and lay it on top of other data sets in a GIS. Um, co-locate those data sets against one another. And then the rest of these files are uh, indexes and, uh, and metadata and other um, ancillary components of, uh, of the shapefile. Technically to have a valid shapefile, you only need the SHP, the DBF, and I believe it's the SHX, which is the index that kind of glues everything together. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, you don't have a valid shape file until you also have a PRJ file. Um, because if you don't have a PRJ file, then nobody knows what the coordinates that define your points, lines, and polygons uh, are based on in your shape file. And it can be a real bear to hunt down what projection a data set is in if it doesn't have a PRJ file. That is, if its projection and reference coordinate system is not properly defined. Um, we've also got a couple of data sets, a CSV. We won't use this reverse def addresses, but we will use this def addresses CSV here and load that into ArcGIS Online as well. Uh, some backup data here, just in case things go awry, we've got this water pumps GeoJSON. We'll digitize this data in, um, in the workshop, uh, but this is just in case digitizing goes bad or you fall behind and wanna grab this very quickly. All right, so that's the data that we're gonna work with today. And everything else that we need is actually just in a browser. Um, so a, a little overview of what ArcGIS Online is. ArcGIS Online, um, gosh, it's been around for almost 15 years now, I think. And, uh, and to begin with, it was really a map viewer. You could create maps and then publish them to ArcGIS Online, but there really wasn't a great capacity for editing data or analyzing data or managing data. Uh, in the online context. And in the last 15 years, this platform has really expanded into what is a, a, a almost complete geographic information system in the cloud. Uh, I say almost complete because a lot of times here in a university setting, we're interested in something specific um, called georeferencing, when we take a, an old scanned map and we turn it into a spatial data set. And, and ArcGIS Online does not yet have geo-referencing, but they are working on it. And, um, and there are other groups working on the technologies that make that, uh, make that possible. And so that's probably coming in the next year or so. Um, but there are other ways to get at that. We won't, the geo-referencing won't be a part of this workshop today. So we'll, we'll make use of analysis and data editing and applications and sharing and all of that in the workshop today. All right, the first thing we wanna do is log in and you'll see that in the workshop, uh, I've got here a link to uh, back to our Stanford landing page, which is just gonna take you back to this page, stanford.maps.rgis.com. You can always go to that URL and get this page and then sign in. So I'm gonna click on the sign in link there and I'm just gonna, uh, let's see, I think probably, yeah, because we started from stanford.maps.rgis, it's already sees that we're uh, wanting to use the Stanford organization. And so if we click on Stanford University, what will happen is we get bounced out to the very familiar Stanford single sign-on. And so we'll do all of that and sign in and I'll get a push here, hopefully pretty quickly. And come on, give me a push, there it is. except it didn't show up. Hmm. Let's try again. Maybe Stanford Wi-Fi is giving me a hard time. There it is, that's what it was, Stanford Wi-Fi. All right, here we go. All right, so I'm back to the page, but now you can see that I'm logged in into my profile on ArcGIS Online. Now, one thing to note is if you've never logged in to ArcGIS Online, um, you'll go through single sign-on and it'll just mint your, your account for you. There's nothing that I need to do to add you to the account. All you need is a valid Stanford login and it uses single sign-on to validate that you're authorized to access our organization. All right, so now we're gonna return to the ArcGIS Online 101 
And the next thing we wanna do is just a, a little overview of the map interface. So I'm gonna go back here and you'll notice at the top of the window, we've got a number of uh, sort of tab links. And the one that we're gonna explore first is the map tab. And the map tab takes us, not surprisingly, to a map. Um, I would suggest not right now for this link. Let's go ahead and not right now that. We're gonna go through um, the classic map viewer uh, and, and map application in ArcGIS Online. And the reason is the new beta map viewer is beta and it doesn't have all the functionality and features that the, that the old classic uh, map, um, map viewer has. It doesn't have all the analysis. It doesn't have a lot of things that this has. And so we're gonna stick with this until it's in parity with the, uh, with the old um, application. Now, what you see here is just a slippy map. This is just like any web map you would pull up like Google Maps. It's based on something called tiles. And so you can kind of see those tiles coming in as I zoom out, you know, really extremely. Actually, what you're looking at here is a single tile. This is zoom level zero, tile number zero, uh, comma zero. And this shows the entire world on one 256 by 256 uh, um, pixel PNG, a portable network graphic. If I zoom in, it's going to begin like, like that zoom right there is probably uh, four tiles by four tiles. And so now every time we zoom in, it's exponentially increasing the number of tiles so that we get a more uh, resolute uh, image of the surface of the earth. And as we zoom in, if I zoom in really fast, you might see some tiles come in there, but this is a pretty performant application. Um, so it doesn't really show the tiles anymore when you do the, do the zooming. All right, so let's talk about this interface. Obviously, this is the map window. You can use, um, you can use your mouse. Uh, I'm on a Mac, and so I'm using like a two finger up and down to zoom in and out here. Um, there's a classic uh, shift bar and drag a box zoom method that most, uh, most web maps uh, enable, and ArcGIS is uh, not unlike uh, most web maps. And then of course you have the uh, navigation tools up here, you can use those. And if I go back to the home, then it's just gonna give me that first initial um, view that I had when I first opened the map. Once I save the map, it'll give me whatever view that I had when I saved the map. All right, um, the next thing we wanna do is take a look at this. You're looking here at the details panel. This is sort of uh, um, comparable to the table of contents. This shows you things about your map. Um, a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of getting started right here for new mappers. If we look here, this is the content panel. And right now, we have a base map that's called uh, topographic. And if we open that up, there's an, not a whole lot we can do with this. We can see a few things. We might be able to control the transparency, possibly. I'm not sure what uh, what it is, but this is our base map, right? And this is the only layer that's in this map. And what we're going to do over the course of the workshop is we're going to add what are referred to as the operational layers. Those are the layers we're actually interested in. Base maps are great because they give you a geographic context for your operational layers without you having to go to the trouble of the hundreds of hours it actually takes to make a really beautiful scale dependent uh, base map for use in a web map. Um, if we look up here, we can also see that there is a base map uh, um, widget that we can use to change the base map. So we could change to a light gray canvas. This is a really nice one. Um, if you're trying to highlight particular features, it kind of lets the geography, the base map stay out of the way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back to, um, let's see, the topography. There's, an, there's a, actually, they've added a bunch of new, really cool ones. The newspaper one is quite nice. Um, if you can get it to work, maybe it's not going to work. Let's try human geography. There we go. Zoom into that one. And oh, I see what it is. I'm in the ocean. That's why I can't see anything. This is one of those things where you zoom into an area and there's nothing there and you think your map is gone. Um, happens all the time, even to me after 20 years. OK, uh, we've got this ad which is how we add data operational layers. And we'll explore this more as we go through the workshop. We've got an analysis button, which allows us to access some of the analysis tools. This would be analogous to um, the ArcGIS toolbox or the processing panel in QGIS. 
And then obviously we've got save, we can save this map or we can, if we're working on the map and we want to save a copy of it, we can save as. Our sharing options, once we've saved it, we can, we have options to share it, share it with other individuals, with groups, with the public, with the organization, and even embed it in web applications that are really rich and useful. And then some pretty straightforward tools if you're looking for directions, trying to measure things. Um, you can also make bookmarks in, uh, in your web map. Um, finally, uh, you can search for locations. Obviously, if we type in Stanford, there we get Jane, uh, Stanford University and zooms right into Stanford University, just like a typical um, uh, slippy map. Now, what we want to start doing is working with our own data, right? And so I'm going to go to the next step in this, uh, in this workshop. And so we'll just zoom right down here. And the next step is we're going to um, explore base maps. So um, we don't need to do a new map because we've just created a new map and uh, we've played around with base maps a little bit. What we might want to do is actually add another uh, service from somewhere else on the internet as our base map. And that's what we're going to do now is we're going to add what's uh, what's called a Cardo uh, base map. And that's going to be from an XYZ tile service that Cardo.com serves. Um, this is really useful. And this is actually one of the more useful things about web mapping in general is that you can take a web map and you can bring data sources from all different places, from APIs, from tile services, uh, from a CSV that you might have sitting in Google Sheets or something like that. And you can bring all of that data into a single place into a web map. And ArcGIS.com makes that a lot easier than it used to be, say, 10 years ago, when you had to know a lot of JavaScript to do that kind of stuff. Um, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to add a layer to our map. And we're going to replace the base map layer that we're currently using with the layer that we're adding. And here in the tutorial, what I want you to do is uh, copy this URL right here. And you're just gonna highlight from HTTPS all the way to PNG there, and then right click and copy that URL. That, that URL is very special. You'll see here that it's got these little curly brackets, say level, column, and row. And those curly brackets tell the server that we're asking for the tiles uh, that it's going to send the level as a number in this spot and the column and the rows as numbers in these spots back to our browser. This is just sort of telling the browser how to talk to the server that's at the, under, the other end, the Cardo DB server. So I'm gonna to return to my map here and go here to add and add a layer from the web because this is an, a resource that's out on the web somewhere and I'm gonna reference it using um, this URL. All right, we're going to change the type of uh, data source that we're using to a tile layer because that's what this is. It's an XYZ tile layer. It's using that little, um, this little, little template right here uh, to refer to that tile service and call the correct tiles in the correct order and reassemble them in our browser um, properly. And so I'll just put that in there. I do actually want to replace my base map. So I have an option here. If I don't check this option at, to use it as a base map, what will happen is um, the, the base map will be added as a layer on top of the current base map. So you can have multiple base maps. And so I can turn this image on and off and see, say, a satellite imagery base map underneath it. What I'd rather do in this instance is actually replace the current base map with it. And I'm going to go ahead and call this um, the Cardo uh, I think this is, what is it called? Dark matter. And we'll call, uh, we'll give cardo.com some credit. And subdomains are, uh, if you look here, you'll see this little bit here. So this means CardoDB actually has several tile servers um, to kind of load balance the, uh, the, the load of transferring these tiles across the network. And what we want to do is grab this little list. It's just A, B, C, D. These are the, um, the names of the tile server at Cardo's end. Um, and so, you know, one tile server will be Cardo DB dash base maps dash A. And the next one will be B and C and D. And this is telling ArcGIS how to, how to put that together. It's a little template for it. 
Um, and that should be it. I'm gonna go ahead and click add layer and cross my fingers. It's always a good idea to cross your fingers. And it was so successful so quickly that I barely notice uh, a difference. Um, but except that I see that I have Cardo dark matter here and I can see that this is actually the Cardo DB dark matter base map that I'm using. All right, and I think the next thing we wanna do is just a little deep dive into this uh, template. And I explained this in the, work, uh, in the workshop document a little bit, but first I'm gonna go here to the chat and see, does anyone have any questions? If you have questions, please do. Uh, just drop them in the chat. I'm going to um, I'm going to check the chat every once in a while uh, to see if anyone has a question. Um, Christy, I see that you have your hand up. If if um, ah okay, so you don't have a question. Good. All right, then uh, then we're just going to continue. If you have a question, I'll stop again in a couple of steps. Um, just throw it in the chat, and we'll address those as we as we move along. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is just a little bit more about um, about making these tiles. So that, that template that I, that I put into the, the dialog box on ArcGIS.com is not actually the original URL for the Cardo Dark Matter base map. The original URL, like CardoDB's um, default template is this, and you'll see it's got CardoDB base map, and it's got an S there instead of the whole uh, word subdomain, and it's got Z, Y, uh, X, and Y instead of zoom and column and row, right? Um, so it's just a little different way to say the same things, but ArcGIS Online expects you to translate it into this template that it likes to use. And what happens is um, when you give ArcGIS Online this template, it knows to put the level into the same spot that Cardo is expecting it. It knows to put the column into the same spot, the row, and that subdomain into the same spot, the numeric values or the ABCD. And, and so it'll build those URLs on the fly to grab those tiles and, and then CardoDB can kind of um, communicate with ArcGIS online. So this goes just a little deeper into how to do that. It's useful if you find a tile map service other than CardoDB that has a slightly different template, um, you can figure out how to change that template so that ArcGIS online can, uh, can ingest it. All right, so now we've got this nice interactive web map here that has Cardo's um, uh, base map in it. So from this point on, we're gonna be working mostly with our own operational layers. And this is where it's gonna get a little complex. And sometimes we're gonna do things that could be done another way. And I'll explain to you why we're doing them the certain way that we're doing it. Um, because often there is extra functionality. If you, for instance, load a data set in a certain part of the ArcGIS online infrastructure rather than directly into your map. And so we'll talk about that. And what we're going to use um, as our sort of topic is this map made by John Snow in 1856 um, uh, or 1855. Um, this map was, uh, was a map of a cholera outbreak that occurred in the summer of 1854 in London, England. And, um, and this is one of the most uh, deadly cholera outbreaks that ever happened in London. Hundreds of people died within a matter of days. And John Snow was a surgeon. He was actually a fairly famous surgeon, even at that time. Um, he, he was uh, the anesthesiologist to Queen Victoria. He revolutionized anesthesiology as part of his career. And then he went on to uh, discover that cholera was uh, transmitted by water, prove actually that uh, cholera was transmitted through water rather than through the air. And this map that we're going to be um, uh, working with uh, was part of his proof, this, this report on the mode of communication of cholera. Really interesting actually um, for, for uh, 19th century epidemiology, um, but the map itself is, is just an incredible work of cartography. And I'll zoom down here. This is actually embedded from uh, davidrumsey.com. And some of you will be familiar with our David Rumsey Map Center. So that's where this map material is coming from. Um, this is a zoomable copy of the map, and I can zoom in here um, and take a closer look at this map. And we can see that if we zoom into the center of this map, this map shows uh, every address in this neighborhood where the outbreak occurred. And what John Snow did was he put a tick mark at each of those addresses for every person in that household that died of cholera. 
And then he also mapped all of the water pumps. You can see the central Broad Street, the very famous Broad Street pump there. Uh, another uh, little Marlboro uh, Street pump, pump there. Um, there are in all 13 maps, uh, 13 pumps in this map. And we'll, we'll digitize all of those um, in the course of the workshop. That's just a little background. Uh, this is a great video up here. You can watch later on on the, uh, on the history of this particular event in this map. All right. So the first thing we wanna do is learn to search for content on ArcGIS Online and then add it to our map, right? And so here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to um, the search tab. We're gonna go back to our map. And I'm gonna go up here to add and search for layers. And you'll notice in right now in the, in the interface, I'm set to this facet, my content. So I'm only searching my stuff. And that's the default when you go into search. I'm gonna change this to ArcGIS Online. And then I'm gonna search for John Snow. And it should bring up John Snow's map. And the first hit is the map that I want you to use. And if we click on its little card, we'll get a little bit more information. And this is actually a version of the John Snow map that I digitized and georeferenced years ago when I worked at Yale. Um, that's why it's coming from Yale Maps. And, um, but we're gonna add this to our map. So just click on the add map button. Note that you could also here in the card, just click on the plus sign to add it to your map as well. And what happens is we get that image of John Snow's map added to our, uh, our web map here. And if I go back to my details, I'm looking here in the content view of the details panel, I can toggle that map on and off. And what that allows me to do is see that this map is actually what's called geo-referenced. It is sitting where it belongs in geography. You can see that because these streets from the modern map, this Cardo uh, dark matter base map, continue on to the John Snow map there and there, Oxford Street running all the way across there. This map has, uh, has been uh, moved and it has spatial data embedded in it now so that a geographic information system uh, can see where to put that map against other data sets. So now we've made changes to this map. And um, let's see, we're going to, let's go back here and see what our next step is. Add the layer to our map, yes course, and finally save our map. All right, good deal. That's the next thing we're going to we, we're gonna do. Um, go ahead and just click save, and you're going to get prompted to name your map. Now, the name of objects in ArcGIS Online um, sort of unfortunately have to be unique for the entire organization. That means that if all of us in this workshop right now name our map, John Snow's map, nine or 10 of us are going to get errors. So name your map, John Snow's map. There we go. And then put something like your SUNET ID or your, or your email. And then ArcGIS does require that you put in both a summary and tags. So we'll call this John Snow. Maybe we add cholera and that gives us tags. Notice that I've got folders that I could add this to. I've got a John Snow folder, but I've got bunches of stuff in there. So I'm just gonna leave it in my, in my um, default uh, high level folder. But you can begin, if you work in ArcGIS Online, begin to develop folder structures where you can put things and be a little more organized, which is not a bad idea. If I click save that map, hopefully I don't have a map already named that. And you'll notice that my map has been updated here at the top with the name of the map. Um, and that's it. That's really uh, about all the change uh, that happened um, after we saved it. Um, it's really important to save often, even in a web context, because if you accidentally go here and click on new map, um, it's going to lose, uh, you're going to lose everything that you haven't saved since the last time you saved. Um, just like in art map, maybe they're trying to be nostalgic. Um, uh, you know, art map and ArcGIS Pro. Um, for years, we've, we've complained about the fact that they don't have auto save. Well, um, I guess to be uh, in parity with their desktop, neither, neither does the application. So save often. You'll see in the, in the workshop, I tell you to save all the time. So now we're ready to upload data. And uh, the first time we upload data, we're just going to upload it through the map interface, really simply. Um, we're going to go back here uh, to 
the add data and we're going to add a layer from a file. So click on that add layer from file link. And I'm going to go ahead and choose the file and it's in that downloads for in my downloads here in my AGO 101. Whoops, that's not it. Got the wrong zip file. And before before I go any further, I'm going to talk just very briefly about this. Now, remember, a shape file is not a file, it's a bunch of files. And that's kind of a, a hassle for a web browser to deal with. And so ArcGIS Online prefers that you zip those shape files up and upload them in, uh, in a zip file. You've already got a zip file in your data folder here of the study area. So just select that and click open. And now generalized features, well, this only has four vertices, so that doesn't even make sense to do that. So we'll just keep the original features here. If you have a very large data set though, like a, um, all the counties for the United States, you might wanna go ahead and generalize these features. And what it'll do is it'll simple of, simplify the vector data um, at different zoom levels for you uh, so that it renders much quicker in the browser. I'll click import layer. And what we should end up with is something like what you see in the uh, in the tutorial eventually come on stanford internet there we go all right so it's imported the layer uh it's brought that layer in since it's the first operational layer the first layer besides our um our john snow map and our base map it's going to come in on top and obscure everything and we want to get it out of the way right so the first thing that we'll do um, this doesn't really have any attributes. It's really just a shape of the area that we're interested in. And you'll see later how we'll use this to control behaviors of uh, some of the geoprocessing tools. But for right now, I just wanna go into the symbology settings and I wanna click on symbols and I'm gonna change the outline. I'll leave the outline um, at the weight it's at, but I'm going to change to an orange outline and a no color fill to make it transparent and click OK. And now, oh, that's a little thin actually. So I'm gonna go back in here to my outline and I'm gonna bump that up to three pixels and turn the transparency way down too. So we'll click OK. Now I can see that nice um, outline square there and, uh, and that gives me my area of interest. So now I'm all done with the, um, with the study area. So I'll click OK and done. And now I've got that operational layer here in my table of contents. All right, let's go back to the tutorial and see where we are now. We've got that layer in here. We've adjusted the symbology. That's great. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to work with a table of data. Um, we've got a CSV in our, um, in our data folder. Uh, so that's what we're going to add. So if I go back here, um, one thing that we want to do, we could add the CSV directly to our map. But the problem with that is that we won't, it won't be added as a spatial data set for one reason or another. When you add a CSV directly into the map, it just adds it as a table and it doesn't fire off this dialogue that asks, oh, does this CSV have spatial data that you want to convert in it? So we're going to go back. Let's see, which study area file do we add? Oh, um, add the, the dot .zip version because that's, um, that's the version that has all of those uh, shapefile component files compressed into one file. Um, so always add the shapefile. Um, ArcGIS Online likes you to zip things up when there's more than one component file. All right, so to add our CSV, we're gonna go actually to a different part of ArcGIS Online, which means we wanna save what we've done. Go ahead and save um, so that your study area stays there. And we're going to go to the home button up here in the top right corner or top left corner, and we're going to go to content. And once we're there, we are going to add an item from our computer. So far, pretty straightforward. Choose a file. And because I've already opened stuff using my browser from this folder, it's going to go straight back to this folder. And I'm going to select the death addresses.csv, not the reverse death addresses, but the death addresses, and click open. Oops, already exists in this folder. All right, let me fix that very quickly. Um, let's see. I'm just going to change the name of my CSV very fast so that I can upload that. 
we'll call it death addresses two. You shouldn't have this problem because you didn't write this tutorial and you don't already have this uh, data set in your, um, uh, in your ArcGIS Online org. So now if I go back here, I should be able to select death addresses to open it. And there we go. All right, good. Uh, give it some tags, call it cholera, deaths, good. Um, and then we do want to publish this as a hosted layer. What that means is that as it reports this data set, it's going to create a web service that makes that data, uh, uh, data set live and available for web maps to use. Uh, now we'll publish it private, privately at first, but eventually if we wanted to, we could make that data service live and share it with other people. They could add it to their web maps, just like we added the John Snow map to our web maps from the Yale Maps user. Um, all right, so this, uh, this particular data set does have in fact coordinates. And so we're gonna check that option, locate features by coordinates. And then what it does is it parses the table and it looks for all of the fields that might have coordinates in them. And here they are, X is longitude and Y is latitude. And then time zone's not important. We don't have any temporal data in here. So we're just gonna go ahead now and click add item. And yep, so let me change that because you can't have the same title either. So we'll call this, um, actually, I'm gonna give it a nice uh, cleaner name, Deaths in Soho, 1854. That makes good sense, doesn't it? It may not let me put a comma in the name though. Yeah, that's because it's gonna be a web service and people are gonna wanna refer to it through URLs. Um, so if we just call it deaths in Soho without the comma, maybe that works. Yes. And in the background, the service name will probably have underscores. In it. All right. So now what we've got is a page. Uh, this is the details page for that particular data set. And um, this is where you can do things like publish it. You can uh, share it with the public. You can actually look at the data here. So I can go in here and I can see that um, here's all of the data that's in this data set. You can see we've got a num cases. This is the number of deaths at each address. Um, we can go to visualization and we can actually see how good a job ArcGIS did at geo-referencing this data. And we can see we've got a nice tight uh, um, distribution of points that looks perfectly uh, correct to me. Um, you get stats. So if you do uh, publish this data set publicly so that other people can use it, or if you put it in a web application that people are looking at, you can see how often this data set is used and viewed and so on. And then there are other settings for sharing the ability to edit and do other things with other people as well. Um, but what we want to do is actually um, go back, open in Map Viewer. So we'll just open it in map viewer and it should open in our current map viewer, which is the one that we already have our John Snow map and all of the other data in. And hopefully, no, it opened in a new map. So let's go back. And that's why it's a good thing that we saved our map before. So if we go back to content, it's a good little segue you will find that your latest content will be here at the bottom and you'll see that your deaths in Soho CSV, which was uploaded is here, your feature layer, your hosted feature layer is here uh, that it's been converted into. And then my web map is right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and reopen that John Snow web map and open it in the map viewer. And now if I go to add and search for layers, I'm going to leave the default my content and there the latest thing that was added is my deaths in Soho 1854. I'm just going to go ahead and click the plus sign and that should bring it right into my map there. And unfortunately what it didn't do is give us nice um, symbolic, it didn't prompt us to change the symbology. All right, so let's do that. So if you hover over the deaths in Soho 1854 here, you'll notice, let's see, it looks like we have more questions, good. 
All right, hover over this. You'll see a little symbology button. It's the third button, so change style. We'll click on that. Right now, we're only using location, uh, which is why we just have dots. What we'd like to do is use that numeric variable, which is called num cases. And if we change to that, then we should see a change in the map immediately. ArcGIS goes and it looks at that data type that we just told it we want to use uh, to symbolize. And it says, oh, well, probably a good way to symbolize points that have a numeric value, value that looks continuous is to use um, a proportional symbol. So that's, that's exactly what I want to use. But I do want to reduce the number of classes. So I'm going to go in here to options. And notice that I have the ability to change this, the range of sizes. But what I'm really interested in doing is classifying the data. And I'm going to use uh, classification with quantiles. And I want to use three classes. And then click OK. And done. If you want to change the color, you can. I'm not going to do that right now. And now as I zoom in, I see that you know my dots are in three classes. It's actually kind of messy at a zoomed out, but we'll, we'll be fine with that for now. And I'm going to go and save my map. All right, let's see where we are now. Add your layer to the map and adjust symbology. All right, let's explore this data. And we're going to view the attributes and look at the statist um, some statistics in the table. So back in the map, I'm going to go here to my Deaths in Soho layer. And you'll notice the second button is actually a show table button. It's a little, uh, a little attribute table there. So if you click on that, you actually get your attribute table to pop up, not unlike it uh, happens in ArcGIS Pro. And we can see there's our num cases field. And so what I'd like to do is actually just calculate some statistics on that field. And this is just a quick, dirty snapshot to see what that particular data set, that particular column looks like in this data set. So the number of values, we have 322 values. That means there are 322 records. So what that means is there are 322 addresses in this data set. The sum of those values, which equals the sum of the total number of deaths in uh, in this outbreak is 578. So that means we have 578 deaths distributed across 322 addresses. The minimum number obviously is one, the maximum 18 right there at that address next to the Broad Street pump. The average is about 1.8 and we get a standard deviation as well. Now later on, we'll see how to calculate that um, based on allocating uh, the death addresses to the nearest water pump they're at. All right, let's see what we want to do next. We've explored some data. Now we're going to create data. So I don't think I did anything that needed it, but I'm a little psychotic about saving things in GIS. So I'm just going to click save, save data. Um, let's see, why do I get much fewer data points on my map than yours? I'm not certain, but it may have something to do with your symbology. So make sure um, that your symbology, uh, uh, that your ranges uh, include one and that, um, that your symbol sizes are, um, uh, are large enough that you can see the smallest class. Um, but that one, that one would be tough to troubleshoot without screen, uh, screen sharing. All right, so we're going to create data now. And so what we want to do now is actually, once we've saved the map, we're going to go back to home and to content. And what we need to do first is we actually need to create a vessel, an empty vessel, to hold the data that we want to digitize into, um, into this uh, vessel. So we're actually going to create an empty hosted feature layer um, to put our data into. So we're back on the content page where we uploaded our CSV, but instead of adding an item, we're going to create an item. So I'm going to click here, and then I'm going to select feature layer, and I'm going to select build a layer. Now notice that I could create, and this is kind of an odd thing that happens in ArcGIS Online. ArcGIS Online allows you to put multiple geometry types into a single layer. So points, lines, and polygons can be effectively in a single layer. That's a little odd because it's different than the sort of model that you use in desktop GIS. So I typically use the, the desktop GIS uh, model and just select the individual um, a data type that I want to create, in this case, points. And so I'll select points and then click Create. 
I'm going to name this. Um, we'll call this, I think I've got several water pumps. Uh, so water pumps in Soho. I think that's unique. And if you were going to use this data set to capture data from your cell phone using, for instance, ArcGIS Collector, which is a different workshop, um, but ooh, excuse me, um, but we could actually do that. We could make this application and then deploy it to a mobile app to collect data. You would check uh, capture GPS receiver information. If you wanted elevation, you would do that, but we don't need any of that. So we're going to click next. Um, I'm going to go ahead and zoom into our area. Um, for this particular data set. Using my shift key, I'll just zoom into London and I'm just gonna zoom into greater London and leave it at that. So that's our, uh, our extent of our data set and we'll click next. And here we're gonna call this feature layer um, water pumps in Soho. And that's all good. We can just, and this is the worst trick in the world to show you, but it's just a quick way to get your summary in there and click done. And now it's going to create that feature class in the background, ready for us to edit data into. Okay, that's great. And so now we're gonna open that in the map viewer. I hope it opens in our, let's see. We don't wanna add it to it. You see, it should just open it in our current map viewer. I'm not sure why it didn't do that before. Um, now it's doing it correctly. Excellent, beautiful. So open in map viewer, we'll open that data set into this map. Now, we actually have one more thing we wanna do. So let's go back to content. And there's our water pumps in Soho. Let's go back to its details page. And we're gonna go to the data tab here. This is where we're kind of looking at the table uh, and the attributes of the data set. Now, there's a couple of attributes here. Um, this is uh, implemented by default, so you can keep track of the records. Photos and files is an attachment field. So if you're doing field data collection and you take a photo of something, it gets embedded in the database. Um, what we'd like to do is add a field uh, to describe each of the water pumps. So we're gonna click on the fields button here. And here this lists all the fields. Not all of them you saw were visible. Some of them are kind of hidden because they're in the background for data collection. We're gonna click add and we're gonna call this field name label. And this will be just the, uh, the name that we use for each of the water pumps that we digitize. And for length, where string is fine. Length is uh, 256. It's entirely too long, probably. And we don't want a default value um, because each of these will have a unique value. So we'll click add new field. And then that gets added here to our field, right there to our, our table. All right, so we'll go back to our map now just by clicking on the map link up at the top and it should take us back to the default map that we're actually working on. Beautiful, now we've got this empty water pumps in Soho. How do I know it's empty? Because I haven't put any data in it. And I can also open the attribute table and see that there's no data found, right? All right, so now what we wanna do is begin creating the data. Let's see if I can get to zoom where I want. I'm gonna zoom into this upper left corner here uh, where we've got a couple of pumps, a couple of water pumps. Actually, there's three good water pumps right here that we can get to in one shot. So um, now what we wanna start doing now is begin editing uh, this data. And that's pretty straightforward. Really all you have to do is click on the edit button. And what will happen is you'll be presented with a, uh, a template, a set of templates. Now we have two vector data sets that we've added to this map. They are currently, because we own them, they're editable to us. Um, and so we'll see you know, if we wanted to create more polygons in our study area layer, or if it were something like building footprints, we could add new features with that. But what we wanna do is grab this new feature template for, um, for our water pumps and just click where there's a water pump. And you'll notice it drops a dot there and pops up this window that wants us to describe this water pump, give us the label. And I think this is um, Little uh, Marlboro Street. 
Now, this is one of the things that really aggravates me about ArcGIS Online is this delete button right where you would expect the save button, right? I can tell you how many times I've put down the first point in a data set and then gone here and clicked delete and deleted it and added it again. Um, but that this is not the save button. Um, it'll be like muscle memory reflex to do it a couple of times, but just click close. They really should put a save button there because it's uncomfortable to click close without saving, right? Um, because we know how GIS is, but you notice that once we do that, um, the point is still there. And now all that's left is for us to simply go around and get this template and digitize each of these water pumps. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And I almost hit delete and you do the same. And you'll notice that actually in the tutorial, I have a little map here. Let's see, oh, did I not add, I thought I added a little image of where all, I need to add an image of where all of these are, where the water pumps are. There are 13 of them. Oh, I think I know what we're gonna do instead. Um, let's do this. Let's add, uh, I added two points. I'm gonna add one more point in this interface and then I see what, I see what the intention is. And I'll add this one. This one's, um, what is this? What's the easy one? Carnaby Street. So let's add Carnaby Street and then we'll move on. And close that. All right. And I'm just going to click on the edit button and click save. And so now I've got a couple of water pumps here. Now, I hate that symbol, so I'm going to go into the symbology for water pumps, and I'm just going to change the symbol for the water pump to uh, this nice blue 20 pixels ought to be big enough to see it. Yeah, there we go. We can see that now, and I'll click OK, and I'm all done and out of there. And save my map, just because I always save my map. Now, imagine that you have more than 13 features. Imagine you have thousands of features that you need to digitize over 20 thousand square miles, right? So you want to divide that work up among a number of people. You don't want to do that yourself. You certainly, uh, if you have the ability to want to distribute that, that uh, work to colleagues and research assistants and so on. And so ArcGIS Online actually makes that really easy to do. Uh, we want to make sure that we save our map. And then the next thing we're going to do is go click on this share button. And you can see now what the share settings on this map are. Currently, I have this, uh, this map shared with no one. It's my map and nobody else can see it. I have a bunch of groups that I'm a part of. I could share it with one of those groups to make it either viewable or even editable to those groups. Um, but what I wanna do right now, um, and if I actually wanted to share this out to other people, I would, uh, I would share the map out at this point. Um, but instead, I'm just gonna click web app, create a web app. And I'm going to use the basic viewer web app. Select that and then click on create web app. It's gonna prompt you of course uh, to create a unique name. So I'll add the word app to the end of that. And then we can, again, you know, your summary is always the same. Uh, click done. And in the background, it's going to mint up this uh, website, an HTML website with JavaScript files and all of the stuff to make all of the things work in the background, widgets and stuff like that. And what we'll get is a nice, friendly configuration interface uh, to kind of make some custom changes to our web application. And so here, all of the defaults are fine. It's going to default to the web, map, uh, the web apps. Um, uh, title and so on. You can change the theme, the colors. I'm not going to mess with any of that stuff because it's all fairly straightforward. I do want to go here to options though, because what we want to do is um, we want to enable the editor, which is down here. So display the editor and add toolbar to editor. And then the rest of this, we don't really need to do, I think think that's it. So we right now we're just interested in creating an editing app. You can go back here and look at all these options. There's all kinds of things you can do to customize this map, but I'll click save and then I'm going to launch the application. 
And so here's the application. And what I can do is you'll notice up here on the toolbar, there is a pencil and that's the edit pencil. And so if I click on that, what I get is my templates, uh, my template for my new feature for my water pumps right there, all right? And so if I go here and I can use my shift key to zoom into this area up here and I see that there are, is a water pump there, there and there that I haven't gotten. So I'm gonna go new feature, drop it, and it's gonna be quite similar to before. So we'll call this Castle Street. And again, now you don't even have the close button. You just have to know to click the X. Such a bummer. Um, but my Castle Street point is there and it's selected. So now if I get a new feature and put it here on the Newman Street pump, and I'm just gonna go around and I'm going to digitize all of these pumps now and try not to click the delete. I'll do it probably once just so you laugh at me. Let's see, everybody does it. Ah, I almost did it again. <laughs> it just wants you to click on it. Um, let's see, all right, so we're gonna move down here. If I move out, we'll get the, the Broad Street pump. That's a pretty easy one. It's easy to find. Oh, did it again. Let's, see. Let's move down. Rupert Street, there's a good one. You know I'm going to click delete eventually. You keep seeing me do it. Um, let's, for simplicity's sake, call this King Street. <laughs> and then here we have Brewer Street. Great. Or we could call it Bridal. It looks like it's actually on Bridal Street. Warwick. Close that. Let's see. I think there's a yeah, there's one down here in Piccadilly. Um, Can be another one down here. No, I think that's it. We'll move over here. I know there's one around here. Yep, there it is. And we get this one is Vigo Street. I think there might be one more sneaky one somewhere that I missed. Let's zoom out and count my points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, got one more. Is it that one that's still selected? Yeah, that's 13. All right, excellent. And in fact, I think this is actually where I put that image. Use the app to digitize the app. We go back to the, let's see if I can get this out of the way. There we go. If I go back to the tutorial here, I think if we come all the way down to this area. Use the app to digitize all pumps. There are 13. Then you'll find there's a little map right there. You can just uh, look there for reference if you can't find one of, the, uh, one of the pumps. The one that usually gets lost is this one right up here at the edge. Um, folks sometimes have trouble finding that. And then this one down here is a little muddy um, and can be a little hard to see sometimes. So now we should have 13 points. And what you'll find about, um, about this application is that there's no save button, right? This is non-volatile editing. The second I put this data point in there and record its, uh, record its label, it's in the map, right? All right, so now I'm gonna go, uh, what I wanna do is go back to my previous tab and click the back button until I get back to my map. And you won't break anything by clicking the back button back through the configuration of that. And what you should find is that now when you get back to your map, you have all of those points in your map. Now, why that map web uh, app is, why this web app is useful is that once you've shared this web application, and we'll talk about sharing uh, in, in just a minute, once you've shared it, uh, you can send it to whoever you want and they can edit their portion of, uh, of those points. And as you have, say, four or five different people editing those points, 
they will show up here in your match window. And you can even create like a visualization dashboard that has a countdown if you know there are a thousand features and you can put a countdown in there that shows how close people are to finishing that. Map. All right, so now we've got all of our uh, all of our water pumps. We've got all of our death addresses. Um, let's go ahead, since we put that data into the map, let's go ahead and turn on the labels for our water pumps. So we're back in the map now. We've got our water pumps here. Let me check for uh, any questions in the chat. Looks like everybody's doing great. Oh, hi, Jeff. Um, and so now let's see, we want to turn on labels. That's it. All right, so labels, there is a, a, a feature here under the layers to get to labels, but you have to click on this little ellipsis at the end to get all these great other tools. Look at all of that. And there we go, create labels is right there for us. Now, that's terrible. It's just labeling with the creator's name. That's dumb. Um, so we want to change this to label because we put all that work into labeling our features. And there we are, we're labeling features. Now in web maps, it's often a good idea to uh, add a halo because it kind of isolates your label text from the background, from the map itself, and just makes it a little more legible. Um, I think uh, at some point you probably, probably pretty close to where we are right now, you wanna turn off uh, the labels. So now if I zoom out just one more zoom level, it should turn those labels off and not render them anymore. Um, and then when we zoom back in, it starts uh, rendering those labels. So that looks great. I'm going to go ahead and click OK and save my map. All right, let's see where we are now. We've done labels. Now we're ready for some spatial analysis. All right, here's the good stuff. Here's where we're getting to the actual uh, uh, taking two spatial data sets and measuring things and, and determining uh, you know what we can from these uh, spatial data sets and, and looking at the relationship between them. And so the first thing we're going to do is create walking time isochrones. These are actually uh, like service areas. This is a very small area, uh, but this is one of the inbuilt functions in ArcGIS Online. I'm just going to go ahead and close that one so I don't go back to it anymore. Um, go back to your map now, and we're ready to click on the analysis tab. And that'll bring up the analysis menu. And what we're interested in looking at is using proximity. And the tool that we'll use is called Create Drive Time Areas. But you'll see within the tool, uh, there is the option to change the, the measurement uh, from driving time. And let's see, I'm going to change uh, this. We're going, what we're going to do is we're going to walk from each of our water pumps. Uh, away from the water pump for five minutes and create a catchment around that water pump. Now that is the same thing as measuring how many people are within five minutes walk of that water pump, right? So let you will just turn that on its head and, and use it the other way. Um, but that's what we want to do is we want to create a walking time of five minutes. And we don't uh, notice that you can, if you're doing drive times and things like that in ArcGIS Online, you can set a start time so that you can incorporate traffic data and things like that. Uh, you can have barriers if you want. If you know that there's a car accident or there's some construction, you can put barriers in there or you're doing some other kind of modeling. All right, so the next option we want to um, uh, check is this areas from different points. Now, what this does is it, is it determines how you handle the overlapping polygons that are generated from the different water pump points in our data set because five minute walk from say these two water pumps is gonna overlap with one another, right? And what we'd like to do is we'd actually like to split those polygons. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna create polygons around each of the water pumps that are A, within five minutes and B, closest to that water pump. And show unreachable areas as holes, that's better, you know, more, more relevant to, to drive times and things of that sort. Now, the resulting layer name, uh, travel from walk, let's change that because I know I've got a million of these. Travel from water pumps in Soho, and then five minutes, it puts that in there because that's the, the walking time parameter that you're using. Now, if you include reachable streets, what that's going to do is it's going to drop a street data set into your map that has all of the streets that are uh, that were used to determine whether or not you could reach um, that load those locations. 
Um, these walking times are used, this is a network analysis. This is not a straight line analysis. What we're doing is we're de determining how we can walk for five minutes from each of these water pumps along the street network. So that's important to understand. The next thing that's important to understand is that we're actually going to consume credits when we do that. This now up to this point, we've used negligible number of credits. We've used almost no credits um, creating this map. ArcGIS Online is a credit-based um, application. When you first log into your ArcGIS Online app, um, account, you get 2,000 credits to use. Um, that's actually a lot of credits, and it's it's not very often that somebody pumps through the, that number of credits. And when they do, it's usually because they geocoded something the wrong way. Um, so you've got plenty of credits. You don't really need to worry about those things. And if you run out of credits, you just have to email me, and I'll give you more. Um, but the way to figure out how many credits something is going to use is usually if it's going to use credits, you'll see a little show credits uh, link at the bottom of the tool or somewhere in the tool. And then you can click on that to get a credit usage report. And so here I've got 13 water pumps that I'm going to measure network distance from. And that's going to use six and a half credits. Big deal. That's like nothing. Um, not even a piece of chewing gum. So we're going to run that analysis. And this actually could take a minute or two to complete. And you'll see that you get this progress not really progress, it's more like a spinning wheel of death that doesn't tell you anything about how long it's going to be before you see the map. So we'll let that run. It usually is about 30 seconds to a minute and a half um, before it finishes. Uh, and so let's go see what we're going to do next. Often it will come in with uh, an automatic, um, it'll automatically visualize and add color to the symbology, but if it doesn't do a good job of it, we'll, we'll actually change it. Still thinking. All right, let's go look and see. Uh, why do you get this? Okay. Still waiting. I should have a like a game or something, um, a Kahoot game. That's a great idea for this workshop. I'll have a Kahoot ready um, for while we wait uh, for this to happen next time. All right, let's let's uh, let's go do something more fun than this. Um, why don't I show you this? We'll go back to the ArcGIS Online um, landing page and I'll show you another uh, really great um, tutorial that we've got up here. And that's uh, Andrea Olson is our map librarian here at Brander Earth Sciences Library at Stanford. And she has put together um, this uh, tutorial, this workshop on how to create story maps, uh, which is actually perfect for her because this story map called Pancakes and Silver, which is actually a really cool story map about how to take paper maps, digitize them, and put them into three-dimensional uh, formats and, and turn them into a narrative application. Uh, this Pancakes and Silver that she made uh, last year one story map of the year uh, from Esri. Uh, so she's the person to learn to story map from. And if we go back here, you'll see this create story maps is just a walkthrough of some of the ways uh, that you can create really compelling story maps. She's also uh, a graphic designer um, uh, by training. And so there's some really great points on typography, on highlighting things. And, and just basically using the story map features to the, uh, to the best that you can uh, in story maps. Story maps is really kind of a magical application. It does so many cool things. We use it for stuff other than mapping um, all the time. All right, let's go back to my map and see, do I have, yes, I have polygons. All right, so I have polygons here. They're ugly, they're, uh, they're unsymbolized. So I'm just gonna go really quickly in here and I'm going to click on the symbology, I'm gonna change the attribute to uh, notice that label is in there. That's that field that we created in our data set, our water pumps data set. Um, so I'm gonna select that and then ArcGIS should just symbolize everything based on the label value, the unique values and labels. That's exactly what it did. And now we can very clearly see we've got these 
um, these polygons that indicate which of the water pumps are the quickest to get to uh, from any point in our map. And so I'll click done with that. And I'm gonna save my map. Now our map's gonna get a little messy here um, uh, pretty quickly because we're doing lots of different things now and the analysis produces all of these, these new layers. But the next thing I wanna do is actually, and let me just show you this little trick. Notice that my deaths in Soho layer is underneath all my other layers and I can't see it, but I can actually grab it and move it up in the table of contents so that it's visible on top of those other layers. Now what I wanna do is I want to tag each of my death addresses with the water pump that it's nearest. And because I've got this set of polygons now that are sitting under the, the death addresses, um, I can join those to those polygons. And what will end up happening is conceptually, it's kind of like pushing the points through the polygons and the points pick up all the attributes of the polygon that they, that they pass through. So that the points that are here nearest Newman Street will become tagged with Newman Street's attributes the ones nearest Broad Street and so on will be tagged with those. And so that's an analysis technique and we're going to actually, uh, this is under the summarized data um, uh, functions. And we're gonna go here, summarize, I believe within. And is that right? Yeah. Summarize data, no, we wanna use join feature. That's right, we're doing a spatial join here. So join features, now this, I'm, I am not a big fan of this interface. I think it's really busy. And so I'm gonna slow down a little bit and try not to be the chatty Kathy I usually am and, and talk too fast. Um, but my target layer here is the layer that I want to put data into, right? It's the layer that I wanna augment. And so that is my Des and Soho layer. The layer that I want to use to augment that data set is going to be my walking time polygons from, uh, from the Soho water pumps. The spatial relationship uh, that I'm gonna use is intersects and that's perfectly reasonable because if a point inters uh, these points are only gonna intersect one polygon um, and all of the points are on top of a polygon. So each of the points is going to get uh, 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 tagged with a particular polygon. All right, one-to-one -one is fine. Which record to keep? The first record, that doesn't matter because we're gonna have a, a singular records. There's not gonna be multiple matches for each of these death addresses. Each death address is only gonna match one polygon, right? Um, keep all target features, that's always a good idea. Let's see. And result name, join features to death. That's perfectly fine. Now here we've got the show credits again. And here's how many credits to use. Again, not even a cup of coffee, no big deal, not even a piece of chewing gum. Um, and here's another option that might be of interest. Now, I'm just going to, I am actually going to create results as a hosted layer feature because why not? Um, is it gonna let me do that? Why is it not gonna let me do that, I wonder? It's not letting me check that, I think. I wonder why that is. Hmm. All right, let's run the analysis. Hopefully this one won't take as long as the walking times. I see that I use completely within in the tutorial. It should work the same as intersects with, um, with points. And still waiting. Let's go back here to the, oh, there we go. We get a new version of our data set. And if we're lucky and everything went right, we can open up the attribute table. We should still have 322 features. And that's what we've got, 322 records. We still have our original um, num cases, address, X coordinate, Y coordinate, all of that. Uh, but if we scroll to the right, we'll notice that now we also have each of our death addresses tagged with all of the data from the walking times layer, the polygons that we generated. And in particular, we've tagged it with the label field, the name of the water pump that it's nearest. So each of these death addresses now knows which water pump it's nearest in terms of walking times. And we're gonna use that now to do another summary stats. 
Um, but we're instead of going to in, instead of using the simple summary in the attribute table, we're going to use summary statistics from the analysis tools. So I'm going to go ahead and click save because I added a layer in some data and go back to the analysis tools here. And we're going to summarize and summarize with, you know, let's see, I think it's uh, now summarize within and the area layer to summarize features with this boundary. It's a polygon and we're going to actually use our study area. Now this seems weird, um, but what it's going to do, it should give us um, a table uh, that has uh, summary statistics for all of the features that are within our study area. And you have to kind of give it um, this polygon layer uh, to summarize within. Um, that's just how this tool works uh, to do summary stats. So you do have to have like a study area there. Um, let's see, our join features is the data set that we want to summarize. And let's see, we are going to uh, count num cases and we're going to use we want a sum so this is where we're saying uh, that we want to all the statistics that we want to summarize for num cases so i'm going to do a sum a max and then let's see num cases and then num cases and let's do an average and then also standard deviation and again, this is a clunky interface. You just have to kind of look at it and see what they're talking about in some cases. But if you've used ArcMap or ArcGIS Pro, some of these tools will use the same uh, verbiage. And now this is important. We need to select our group field. This is like a case field in a summary stats. Um, and so the field that we want to group everything by is that label field, because that's the label field that says, all right, this death address is nearest the Broad Street pump. And so what we'll end up with, um, if everything goes well, is a table with a row for each polygon in our walking times data set and a summary of the points within that um, particular polygon. All right, we don't need to do any of that. That all looks fine, I think. And we'll do show credits just to, just to see how much of Stanford's money we're spending. Not much at all, no problem. And We'll run the analysis. How are we doing in time? Not bad, 10 minutes, that's good. And this will just take a second. Let's go and check what we've got on the agenda next. I cannot get this Zoom toolbar out of my way, okay. Um, all right, so there's walking times we did. We did this aggregation. We're doing summary stats now. Um, measures of spatial central tendency will be next. All right, great. Still joining these features and summarizing. Um, you know, in, in a web context, they don't provide you with, uh, with a 16 gig, uh, gigs of RAM and, uh, and, a, and a powerful CPU. Uh, you get a little bit of compute, um, probably not much more than a Raspberry Pi, probably. Um, now we have our summary stats. Um, and so we didn't get a feature layer. Um, I don't, or did we? Did it add a layer? Let's see. Maybe it just, no, it didn't. So it gave us a single point in each of the polygons to represent the data. But what we're really interested in, oh, it put it, it didn't group. Why didn't it group things? I'm really bummed about that. I missed something. All right, let's go back to analysis and summarize data and summarize within polygon. We're going to set this to study area, summarize features, deaths. There we go. Let's see, we're going to do the join features. And this time I'm just going to do um, num cases and sum and then. Uh, let's do num cases and average. Field to group by is going to be label. And I don't know why it wouldn't work with those settings. So let's try it again. Ah, yeah. 
Let's try this. Summarize again. It's a good name for this one. But I'm crossing my fingers. Sometimes crossing your fingers makes it happen. All right, and then let's just go back here. We're going to do um, summarize center and dispersion tool. And this actually outputs a number of data sets, which are kind of interesting. Um, and then once we're done with that, we'll talk about sharing. And that's about perfect. All right, let's close this. Oh, I see what's happened. All right, let's see. Maybe this is it. This might be the grouped table here. I think, yeah, that's what it is. All right, here we go. This may be the original one too. So down here at the bottom, you get two data sets. And what I, what I guess is happening is this data set has a single point, which is probably related somehow to this these are the counts of the points there by group and then the, there's a related table um, that has summaries and so here you can see for each facility i have a row and then i have a count of points and so this count of points if i sort descending this is the number of addresses that's affected um, by the outbreak um, that is nearest each of the water pumps and you can see broad street pump is far and away the highest number in this column and then in this uh, the same is the case in the sum num cases so this is the number of deaths this is the addresses this is the deaths that that occurred nearest the broad street pump the maximum number in almost every case you see that the numbers are highest for the broad street pump the only difference i think uh you get a different you get the same value for rupert street there um because uh it has such a low number of cases all right let's go ahead and go let's close this and the last thing what was it we want to do oh yes um measures of spatial central tendency so it's spatial data right we want to know what's the spatial mean of this uh, distribution of points and, and things of that sort so again we'll go to the analysis tools and I believe that, um, let's see, what is this? Is this when it been proximity? No, let's summarize. Summarize center and dispersion. And we're gonna use our summary uh, data. Actually, it doesn't matter. We could use, um, uh, we would get an interesting result if we use the summer, uh, summarized data and say grouped it. We would get a spatial mean for each of our groupings of, um, of death addresses. But what we want to use is just our original uh, deaths in Soho. And we're going to look for the central feature. That's going to select the feature, the actual feature in our data set that's nearest the spatial mean. We're going to calculate the spatial mean because that's cool and easy. The spatial mean is actually all of the X coordinates averaged and all of the Y coordinates averaged and those two averages taken as a coordinate pair. The median center is a little different and it works really great when you have a widely dispersed set of points. And what the median center does is it minimizes the distance from the, uh, from the median to every point in the data set. And so um, unlike the mean center and unlike the average in general, it is not as heavily affected by outright. And then we're going to calculate a one standard deviation ellipse. And this is like a standard, it's like a spatial mean, a spatial standard deviation. What it does is it around the spatial mean creates an ellipse uh, uh, based upon the projection of the data. In this case, we're at a higher latitude, so it won't be circular. If we were at the, uh, at the equator, it would be a circle. Um, but this ellipse is going to contain uh, uh, sixty-seven percent is that right for one uh, SD? Sixty-seven percent of our data, um, or for two SDs, it would be ninety-five, and three, it would be ninety-nine, and, and so on. Um, our weight field. So imagine what we're doing in this case is um, we're taking a printed version of the John Snow map and we're putting quarters at every address, and then we're finding the balance point of that piece of cardboard that is the John Snow map, right? And so if we don't weight it, we're just putting one quarter down. If we do weight it, then we're putting stacks of quarters based on the number of deaths at each of those addresses. And so we're going to do that. We want to weight this so that it pulls it 
uh, in the direction of the intensity of the outbreak itself. And then if we use the group by option, we could then uh, create these shapes for um, each of the individual uh, groups of death addresses based on proximity to water pumps. But we're gonna leave that one blank. And then describe distribution, that should be fine. We're gonna skip showing credits because we're down to the wire now and I'm just gonna click okay. And this should take a minute or so, just like always. Let's go ahead while we do that and see what's on the agenda now. I believe sharing. All right, so sharing uh, we'll have to wait for, but one thing that I do wanna point out is that you have the ability to create groups um, and you have the ability to share viewing of your data with those groups. But, um, and if your feature layers are editable, they're not view layers, then uh, you have the ability to share, uh, then everyone you, that you share those data sets with will be able to edit them. Um, you can create view layers in your maps so that that protects your data from being edited. Uh, but it's also possible to create uh, groups that allow editing. And so that's something that I have to do. So for instance, if you're working on a collaborative project and you need to create a web map and a web application that multiple people need to work on, uh, multiple people need to edit it, not simultaneously, but you know, at different times, um, then what you need is an editing group. And those editing groups can only be created by an administrator of our organization. Um, and, and the reason is, you know, it's the Spider-Man rule. With great responsibility comes great, uh, or great power becomes great uh, responsibility. And so we need to talk about what it is you're going to do with this capacity and who you're going to share it with. But we create these um, for folks all the time. There are also interorganizational groups. So if you're, for instance, working with the city of Santa Clara, the city of Santa Clara has ArcGIS online organization. And so we can create a group that you can put content in and share with folks from uh, the city of Santa Clara um, through their organization. And we can create those groups so that they can edit objects or they can just see objects. It depends on what you're doing in collaboration with those folks. Um, so I just want to highlight that we won't actually do these things, but those are parts of the uh, of the workshop that I go on to explain how you can uh, have these created and what they provide you with. All right, let's go back and see if we've got some shapes in here. And yes, we do. All right, excellent. Uh, so the first thing we want to take a look at is, and I'm going to just going to go here to the legend because it gives us a little uh, more um, information about what we're looking at. And I'll zoom in here to the central area. So here is the ellipse. This is the circle within which one standard deviation, 67, 68% of our data uh, in this data set, 68 or 68, 68% uh, 68 of the deaths, not the addresses, because remember we weighted it. So it's using the deaths, um, number of deaths, not the number of addresses here. Um, but that's the ellipse within which one standard deviation of our data occurs. It's the, it's the, um, the central, uh, central portion of our distribution of points. Uh, this next point, uh, this blue point right here, is the actual feature, um, source ID 24 from our original data set, yes, in Soho, that is nearest the centroid of, um, of this distribution of points. The next point we've got here, this green one, is the mean center. That's the average of the X and Y uh, located as an XY coordinate pair, right? And so that's the the mean of the distribution of deaths, because remember we weighted it. This median center, again, uh, minimizes the distance from the median to every point in the data set. So it's another good measure. Um, and it kind of is not as uh, affected by, uh, by the outliers. And you can see that it actually pulls uh, a little bit closer to that broad street pump there. All right. And then I think that's it for those shapes. We've gone through all of those shapes and explained what they are. Um, again, you can run as an experiment if you wanna run that tool again with the same exact settings, but group by facility colon label, you'll get the same uh, features for each of those polygons. And one of the interesting things about that is you'll find 
that the spatial mean of each of those, distrib those individual distribution of points allocated by proximity to water pumps is pulling, it looks like it's kind of pulled towards that central broad street pump. Those spatial means of the outlying water pumps all lie within these, these inside boundaries of, uh, of, the, uh, of the polygons as if they're being pulled through that, the, the, to the central point. All right, I'm gonna click save. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, about sharing. So I've saved my map and I'm gonna to go to the share function and I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna share this publicly just to show you what happens. I'm gonna click on the everyone uh, link and what will happen is I will be prompted because my data layers in this data set are not shared publicly. And uh, that means that I need to update the sharing on those particular points. The problem is that I've got editing enabled on these points and it's warning me here that I'm unable to share editable layers publicly um, if I want to do that, I have to go into the settings of those of those individual layers on their details pages, and I have to check the option to enable public editing. You can do that. You might be crowdsourcing something and allowing people to uh, to publicly edit, but ArcMap will not let you share things that are editable publicly. All right. So what I'm uh, what do I have you do instead of doing that? So yeah. So we're gonna click uh, not click done. Um, I'm going to unshare this and actually if I, I think if I just click close, we'll do that. All right, so we canceled out of that and I'm going to cancel out of the update sharing. And what I'm going to do is, let's see, click save. And show you one more thing. Now, if I wanted to share this map publicly, and I think this isn't, do I have this in the tutorial? I think I have view layers in here. I've saved my map. I'm going to go back to content. And let's say that the water pumps layer is the one that's publicly shared. Um, and it's the one that I don't want people to be able to edit. Um, so we're going to go in here to water pumps in Soho feature layer. I'm going to go to its details page. And we've gone a little over. I'm, I apologize for that. Um, if you if you have to break out of here, um, the uh, uh, the recording will be available pretty quickly. I'll uh, email everyone once the recording shows up on Zoom. Uh, notice that in the details page of this, we have this option to create a view layer. This view layer is a non-editable uh, version of this particular feature layer. And what that means is while people are editing it, you can have another version of the layer that's visible to the public. So you could be having people edit in the field and then pushing that same data out to a public view that is not accessible to the public for editing. Um, that's what this does. I'm not gonna go through the whole uh, rigmarole uh, because I, we're out of time now. I just wanna show you one other thing and that's this groups feature. So we're gonna click on groups up at the top of ArcGIS Online. And you should all have the ability to create a group. And we'll call this uh, John Snow again. And there we go. And we'll give it a summary and same tag. And who can view this? Everyone's going to be able to. No, we want people in our org to view this. Who can join it? Only those invited. That's a great setting. If you've got editing enabled on your on your layers, who can contribute? Group members only. That means people, other people can share content with the group. It doesn't necessarily mean that they can edit the content. Remember, I said we can create editing groups for you, but you can't create those for yourself. And I'm using a a, a version of my profile that's not an administrator, so it looks like what you can do. I'm going to go ahead and create this group. And then you'll see here, I can invite users to my group. And so I'm going to start search for myself. And there's me in another profile. I'll add me to my group. And I can also add items to the group. So here I'll search my content, but I can just check this web map that I've been working on and add those items. And I've successfully added that web map to the group. And there it is in, uh, in my group. Um, anyone that I add to this group can now view this map um, and uh, access. In fact, actually, I may have to update. 
the sharing on this. Let's see. Nope, there it is. It's already updated the John Snow again sharing because I shared this content with the group. So anyone who's a member of this group can now see it. Um, I don't have to share it individually with people. All right, let's take a look one more time, see if there's anything else, any loose ends to tie up. And there's a few layers. I went through that and what they're good for, editing groups and inner org groups. And that looks like it. So there's a learn more section here. If, uh, if you're dying to learn more about ArcGIS Online, the great thing is that there is um, learn.arcgis online. And I've actually embedded that in the tutorial here. So this is a live version of ArcGIS Online's lesson gallery. And you can go up here, you can facet to all the different software products that they make. I've got this one faceted to ArcGIS Online. If you're interested in doing field data collection, then you can facet, say, to field operations. And here's all of their tutorial materials on creating and executing field surveys using ArcGIS Online and probably Collector or their new app is called Field, uh, field Data. Um, and that, I believe, brings us to the end of our workshop. Let's see if I've got anything else in this web now. Nope, that's it. Um, so let's go here and see if there are any more questions. Doesn't look like it. I hope this was useful to folks. Um, Nope, no questions. I hope this was useful. Uh, look for the recording and I will actually um, upload the recording to YouTube and embed it in this tutorial. So if you wanna forward this tutorial to any of your colleagues who might be interested in, uh, interested in this, I'll reteach this live on the fly probably in a couple of weeks, but it will also be available uh, for self-serve um, just as soon as I can get the Zoom video downloaded and then back up into our YouTube channel so I can make it because um, that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, one last note is that we have a Slack channel. Um, if you're interested in uh, coming to talk to us on our Slack channel, you can go to stanford-geospatial.slack.com and that's how you can uh, join our Slack organization. It's open to everyone at Stanford and, um, and we do a lot of support there. So if you have questions, you have trouble getting through any of the steps in this uh, workshop but didn't have time uh, to ask questions or just or were a little shy about asking questions, you can send me a personal message on Slack or you can post to the general um, or the workshops uh, channel on our Slack. Um, I hope this was useful. Thanks for showing up and look for more workshops in the future. We're probably gonna run a Google Earth Engine intro uh, next and um, I may put that up and schedule it for next Friday. So if you're interested in, in uh, doing some of the things that we've done with vector data, points, lines, and polygons here in Art, uh, ArcGIS Online, um, just wait till you see Google Earth Engine and what you can do with 60 petabytes of uh, Earth observing data with 40 years of back catalog. Again, my name is Stace from the Stanford Geospatial Center. Check us out at gis.stanford.edu and hopefully I'll see you at the next workshop. Thanks for attending.